with over 400 celebrity interviews and tons of pop culture nerdiness, Too Opinionated is a safe haven for your inner geek. Find us at MeisterCon.com or on YouTube under MeisterCon Pod. And please subscribe. It would really help us out. Thanks, everybody. Hi, everybody. Welcome to another edition of Too Opinionated. I'm so excited today. I've got actor Chippo Chung with me. So welcome, Chippo. Hi, Mike. I am so <laughs> excited to be here. And we'll start first off with the pronunciation of my name. I was always um, slightly embarrassed as a child yeah. because I knew I was mispronouncing my name, even though it was my name. Well, yeah, <laughs> I'm notorious for doing that. So correct me, please. <laughs> I pronounce my name Chippo. Chippo. Chippo Chung. Um, but if I was a native Shona speaker, uh, I'm from Zimbabwe originally, and yeah. uh, one of the main indigenous languages is Shona. Uh, with a Shona accent, I would say Chipo. But I don't pronounce it that way. I say Chipo. Um, yeah. <laughs> well, I think it's lovely. And I know because I, I looked that up, it means gift. That's right. That's right. Abigail means uh, in English, or I guess Abigail is a Jewish name originally, but also means gift from God. Not too bad. <laughs> Not too bad. Well, Michael is normally, you know, um, one like God or one who walks with God, that type of thing. So. Right, right. A lot of our names have those religious. I didn't actions. know that. One who walks with God. I guess he's the archangel um, and I'm God's gift to the world. There you go. Sounds like it's going to be a pretty good podcast. <laughs> <laughs> well, so Chiba, let's let's start this way. Tell me a little bit about, you know, what got you into the entertainment business? Because I think you've got kind of a unique story growing up. And then how did you get into uh, into the entertainment business and, and what made you want to be an actor? Well, I guess the same way as you from watching TV and yeah. what were videos back in the day, um, I it's a, it's a remarkable thing that Hollywood is this international product and the lingua franca of television for the English-speaking world. So I grew up in Zimbabwe, um, but I grew up watching American television <laughs> and British yeah. television as well. You know, um, British TV is really good. You know, we're just kind of getting exposed to it over the last decade, really. Mm -hmm. um, but it's, I, I mean, a lot of a lot of police shows, but they're really good. No, I love the way that we've um, really internationalized now. And with the streamers, that there's much more multiculture on yeah, streaming platforms and that we're getting into um, series and uh, popular culture from Asia, from India, from yeah. Africa. But when I was growing up, it was mainly American television. Um, and then I was also uh, quite academic and always into English. I loved English. I loved literature. I was an oh. avid reader as a young person. Um, and I loved plays and theatre. So I was in, in high school plays and musicals and um, studied Shakespeare and particularly loved the classics. Um, so that's that's where my, my interest started. Uh, oh. I remember for my what we did in, in Zimbabwe, we did we had a kind of old school education, old school British education. So we did what were called then O levels and A levels. Um, which are exams you take at 16 and 18, basically. Oh. But for my um, A-levels, which was the advanced level, um, to which you graduate from high school in English, I remember, I think I read Emma, the novel, 11 yep. times. And uh, <laughs> I had lot. watched a lot of versions of, you know, every version of Hamlet and every version of Richard II and kind of fell in love with, because I was into old classical um stuff um yeah. the idea of the royal academy of dramatic art and the royal shakespeare company um and so eventually landed up coming to england and training at the royal academy rada 
And my ambition at that time, I think, was to be in the Royal Shakespeare Company in the vein of Laurence Olivier and Vivian Lee and Kenneth Branagh. Mm. If you remember in the late 80s and 90s, um, Kenneth Branagh had a lot of Shakespeare movies. Yes, um, he did. Much Ado About Nothing and Hamlet being the the, the big first ones. And uh, yeah, I was all over that kind of stuff. He's such um, a good actor, but he mostly directs now. Yeah, I mean, he's quite... Um, you know, inspirational in that he, at a very young age, played all these major parts, um, all the major Shakespeare parts, and then became this director and mm -hmm. um, directed Marvel movies. <laughs> and, yeah, I know. Um, it's, it, I mean, yeah, he's such a talented guy. And has such a range. And I guess his model, role model, was was Laurence Olivier. Mm -hmm. It's the great That's a pretty good one. manager. Um, That's a tough one to live up to, though. Mm. Orson Welles was the same though, wasn't he? He yeah. He had directed hundreds of plays by the time he was really? 25. <laughs> and I know, then it's amazing. On the career we know. Have uh because I know you went to school at least a little bit with on the directing side. Have you got a chance to direct at any time? Yeah, I actually was in the States first from Zimbabwe. Um I went to Yale, um uh Yale undergrad and I I studied acting there, not the drama school undergrad, and then majored or or, or focused on on directing. Um it's been this thing in my life that um I first decided I wanted to be a director, not an actor, a director yes. when I was 14 years old. That's pretty early. Um, I uh, watched a lot of movies at the time and uh, I went to a, an old school Dominican convent, like a very Victorian school. We yeah. had to be at school in our uniforms at 10 past seven in the morning, which is hell of early. And I'm not a morning person. Um, and I remember coming to my desk when I was 14 and very grudgingly coming to my desk and swearing to myself. Before that, I wanted to be a lawyer. But that day, I remember saying, I will never be a lawyer. I will never have a job where I have to get up in the morning and go to a desk. I'm going <laughs> to be a director. Um, and funnily, you know, that the life of an actor and my sleep schedule has worked very well. Because as an actor, you know, it's it's a late night thing. Um, That's right. Your energy has to peak at, at about, you know, eight o'clock at night. And that's perfect for me. See, I'm the um, opposite. About eight o'clock at night, my energy is saying, go to bed. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Um, well, I had the choice to to become a, a, a director or an actor, and I always opted for acting. Um, I guess it was a, I think people who become actors, it is like this love affair. You just can't not do it. Um, but yes, I um, have a directing practice and um mainly the last few plays I've directed have been at RADA, um, the yep. Royal Academy of Radic Art, with students who are graduating in their in their final years. Yeah, that's pretty great. And I, I would assume that that background in directing hasn't done anything but help you with the acting because you kind of understand what's going on behind the camera. Absolutely. Uh, and particularly in this day and age, mm -hmm. most of our auditions happen through self-tapes so we are the actor and the director you know in, in a previous time um pre-covid really um one was you know the casting director and you'd be meeting people in the room and they'd be on the other side but now generally you're directing yourself and putting together a you know uh your your take um so yeah what I think do you think well. about that do you prefer the in-person or do you prefer having the control and being able to kind of redo it till you're satisfied. I know a lot of actors. I think the more experienced actors hate what's happened yeah. where it's so impersonal. Um, and I think it is challenging because uh, I think a lot more people get seen, which is wonderfully inclusive, but it right. means you're you're in a just a highly competitive pool myself personally i love it i i i guess i'm a control freak uh, <laughs> i like having control of when i do it i like That's to right. be where i do it i like to see which tapes i actually send in 
Um, and I love that I don't have to travel. I mean, the thing I used to hate when I was in LA was like, you have to go driving somewhere. You have to find parking. You have to not you easy know, to do in LA. Are, and then you walk into a waiting room with 50 other people who, who may look like you or not look like you, see what all the other versions of you are. And then for five minutes, you've got to be in the zone. Yeah. And you I know, know it sounds so stressful to a non actor. Well, that's that's not what it's like on set. That's not the circumstance, you know. I I think when you're on set, you're in a safe space. Um, you have your whether whatever your trailer is, you have a private space to prepare, um, and you have support. You know, um, yeah, it's not such an alien experience once you're actually at work. So right. I can see why you know um, you have to just like drop it on the street. <laughs> <laughs> Um, but I know I'm, there are others who don't, but for me, I, I, I enjoy, um, and if I'm not going to get the job, I'd rather have not have to have left my house. See, that's the way I would look at it. I'd rather like, this is the one I like best, whether they like it or not. I'm happy with this. One. So then we'll just see how it goes. Exactly. Exactly. Yeah. I think, I guess you do miss out on. You know, they're probably they're going to watch if it doesn't fit what they're looking for. They're going to move on where if you're in the room, they might redirect you, you know, and say exactly. Yeah, you could. They have an idea of what you want. And when you're not with them in the room, it's a shot in the dark. You know, you're sending a right. take on the character. Um, but when you're in the room, they can make that small adjustment and see, oh, OK, you can travel this way with us. That's right. But you don't have that feedback. Yeah. So I think I'm, I I think the first time I remember seeing you in a role was probably you were the uh, master's assistant on Doctor Who. Uh -huh. Probably the first time. And then you got promoted to the master in the Badlands. So. <laughs> <laughs> it's true. <laughs> it is so funny. Yes. My first major role on television was Chan Chan Tho. Um, and that. I, I loved playing her. One of the reasons I loved playing her was because I got to act opposite Derek Jacobi. And uh, I said earlier when I was doing my A-level exams that I had watched every version of Hamlet and Richard II, um, which is more rarely done. But I had watched Derek Jacobi's Richard II for the BBC Shakespeare a number of times. So it was an awesome experience for me. So to that's be a big deal. Major prosthetic with... Uh, a motor in my head and a tiny pistol being i'm 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 you know i'm acting with Derek i don't guess they let you keep any of that because that made a really good halloween costume <laughs> the funny thing is i mean i was unrecognizable you know i look at myself in the mirror under the prosthetic and and be slightly freaked out but I have been checked on the street with people saying, you're Chantho. Um, and once I was at LACMA, I was in the line. People love Doctor Who. And um, the, the ticket the ticket salesperson was like, you're Chantho. I was like, what? <laughs> How do you know that I'm Chantho? Because I hadn't said my name or anything. And he was like, no, I know you're Chantho. I know by your teeth. <laughs> now, I love that. You could tell by my smile, which <laughs> I found freaky. Um, yeah. <laughs> well, that's how fans are, though. We obsess over the shows. Mm -hmm. and, and Doctor Who's fans, I think, are a, a special brand of fan. Yeah. It's yeah. a very nice fan base. Very sweet. Yeah. Very sweet. Did you get to do any conventions on the Doctor Who stuff? Um, I I I have back in the day. Um, I, I'm, to be honest, forgetting which one. But, um, uh, yeah, I was... I was a bit upset because there are some beautiful pictures of Chantho and um and some people have said, you know, she was she was kind of sexy. But um the the, the shot that the BBC I mean um, for a girl with a motor in her head. <laughs> <laughs> with um yes, with an antenna. Um but the um the stills photographer, you know, prosthetics are very special. It, it requires lighting to make the magic work right. and he had taken the still when the lighting wasn't on so I had to sit under this um 
image of a of a giant blue turd and say yes, it's me. <laughs> <laughs> I don't. I don't uh, blame you for being upset. But when you have, I remember um, this, it must have been a 12-year-old boy coming to shake my hand. And bless him, he was absolutely shaking, you know, Aww. like a feather. Um, it was a big deal for him. Yeah, it was a big deal for him. Um, but yeah, it was very sweet. <laughs> and well, and you came back and played a different role later down the line, right, for Doctor Who? I did. I played the fortune teller um, the right. next season. Um which was which was also lots of fun, a really, really um fun episode because with Catherine Tate and she's she was yeah. an awesome person to work with. Um amazingly serious for a very comic actress. Really? Uh, that that's kind of surprising. You would expect her to be more joking. Yeah, yeah. She was dead deadly serious. I mean lovely, but deadly serious. Um, and I that's a wonderful episode, just the the premise of it. Um yeah. you know, the sliding well, of door. course we loved you on Camelot, which I'm I'm such a King Arthur fan, you know, kind of mm. read everything I could get a hold of growing up and stuff. So I was so excited for the show and I thought they did a pretty good job with it, but you were kind of the I don't know, an assistant with yes. with Morgana. Yes. Yeah. I I I I love that character as well. Um, and yeah, I wish that it had it had gone on, but there are all these great multi million dollar ideas <laughs> that go well. Once and honestly, it came too soon. You know, I think if it was released now, it probably would have got a couple extra seasons because there's I don't know the, everybody's looking for content and to kind of expand. But at that time, the fantasy stuff wasn't really there yet. But then a few years later, we you know all this fantasy type of uh, show or movie started coming out so i think it would have done better now but i loved mm. it when it was on mm. yeah i think it, i think it was shot the same year that game of thrones started mm -hmm. so that was sort of the beginning um but um yeah i'm loving the stuff that stars are doing now the yeah. serpent queen i know there's so as a as a nerd it's the best time because there's so many things getting adapted to either a tv show or a movie it's you know, it's mm. pretty great. A lot of the the books I read growing up were getting to that. Mm. Yeah. Well, and yeah. The um, his dark materials you you've been working on, and yes, that indeed. was adapted from the books. Yeah, and and brilliantly, brilliantly adapted. Really well done. Yeah. Yeah, you were yeah. like the angel figure on that. I was indeed Zephania, um, yeah. and they yeah. It's a it's a remarkable remarkable book and and an interesting um contrast because previously um a few years before I was in the series AD the Bible continues you which played was Mary a, Magdalene yeah I played Mary Magdalene in this uh, I guess historical biblical epic um uh and I I loved playing Mary to be honest that was one of my favorite jobs um we were out in Wazazat, which is Hollywood in the desert, where um, all these remarkable movies were shot. And they had built this set that was, uh, I think it was the, the largest freestanding set, because it still exists. Wow. They basically built a village that, you know, had streets. They'd built um, their version amazing. of Jerusalem. It was, it was amazing. Um, and I loved doing research on it, and uh, it was a beautiful production. But I was also um, very thrilled to be in his dark materials, which is a kind of counterpoint culturally, yeah. Um, because Philip Pullman's uh, critique of the idea of, uh, which which was my point of view as well, playing Mary Magdalene, um, his critique of how women are disempowered. Um, within Christianity and trying to create this mythical story of this young girl whose curiosity and whose desire to know, uh, to, you know, um, in the Bible is to taste forbidden fruit, but in, in Lyra's story, it's this curiosity, someone who's always curious to know more and willing yeah. to be brave and to adventure. And that is the story we need for young women. Um, so I was very pleased to be um, part of telling that story too yeah i and and you did such a great job i'll tell you the biggest compliment i can give you on that role my um grandfather 
was a Baptist minister till almost till he's, he died at a hundred. He, he probably preached till he was about 98, you know, and, and then passed. But my grandmother um, passed just a few years back and she was in her upper nineties as well, but she watched uh, your performance on that and really liked it. And that was rare, you know, for her to, to really in, enjoy something. She didn't watch much, uh, much TV. And his dark she materials? Really, she, what's that? In his dark materials? No, in uh, um, uh, AD, the Bible. Oh, in AD. She actually really liked that interpretation of Mary, um, which okay. surprised me. I didn't think she would like it because there was, a you know, it, he, he went at it from a different angle. But she did, and she just thought your performance was the best. She really enjoyed that. So I, I wanted to mention that because if my grandmother likes something, you know, <laughs> she would tell you. Otherwise, you can just assume she did. <laughs> well, I'm, th I'm thrilled to hear that because it was very special playing that part. Yeah. Um, and it was funny, you know, when I got the audition for it, and I auditioned very last minute, you know, I got a call from the, that day, like this afternoon you have to come in. But as I said to you before, I, I was educated in a convent. So I was like, I know this stuff. I got it. <laughs> I've done all my background research. But um, but when I was doing it, I did a lot of research on the Gospel of Mary Magdalene. Yeah. Um, uh, which is we got to play her before in something else as well, right? Yes, I was in a production of JC Superstar mm -hmm. when I was just coming out of high school. Um, so yeah, it was my second time playing, playing Mary Magdalene and, um, in both productions, she's, she's a real, well, as she, as she was as a real historical figure, she, um, kind of, um, upends your ideas of, 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 of womanhood. Yeah. Um, uh, but I, uh, I liked what they were, they were trying to subtly promote her to who she was, which was, I believe, um, someone who was hugely respected within that circle of the disciples. Yeah, I, I love that uh, interpretation. I, mm -hmm. I, I think that's very possible. Well, if you go to the biblical texts, um, it says that, that she and Joanna of Chusa, who was also portrayed in the series, um, funded the disciples from their own means, which is to say that these guys, Jesus and the 12 disciples, who, you know, were, were fishermen and, you know, peasant right. types, largely a carpenter, fisherman, but they had these women who had money who were supporting them. They were their patrons. They were the ones who were making it possible for them to eat. Um, uh, and nowhere in the Bible does it say that she was a prostitute. Yeah, no, I know. I know. Mm -hmm. I've I've read the Bible several times, you know, growing up, uh, and yeah, never saw that in there. Yeah, just how you interpret it. Yes. Yeah. 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 I yeah. could go on, on, but I won't. <laughs> well, I know, I know that empowerment of women is is a, a something that you're kind of passionate about. Talk about that a little bit, and about some of the uh, um, charities and things that you're involved with. Well, I suppose um, I come from Zimbabwe, and when you come from a developing country, a developing nation, it's it, it's really impossible to not recognize um, the challenges that um, people of a different social e economic class experience, and particularly women um, being second class citizens anyway. Um, so most recently last year, I've, um, convened a new charity, um, and it works to support the adult rape clinic in yeah. Zimbabwe. And rape is a huge issue, I think all around the world, um, uh, and an unspoken about issue, but certainly in Zimbabwe, it, it is a big issue. Um, and unfortunately often the rape of, of of young women or young children really because male, male children are, are involved too um, but the adult rape clinic provides both um, psychological support counseling medical support testing um, treatment 
uh, and even legal support um, will help you uh, mediate with the police on your behalf and, oh, great. And, and potentially go to court with you to explain um, what the process was after that may explain some of the actions that took place. Um, and it's a remarkable organization. So in London, we're just starting. Um, we've just, I convened a board of trustees and we're starting a charity called Pora, which yeah. in uh, Shana means to heal. Um, but it's a partnership on rape aftercare. Um, so that's very much a, a seed project. Um, but previously, I was very much involved in an organization in Kenya called um, Safe Kenya. Yeah. And that produced theater for health education, for social change, mainly around the issue of HIV. Um, and growing up in Zimbabwe in the 80s and 90s, HIV was just yeah, rampant. Was bad. Um, yeah. um, and in the noughties, uh, antiretroviral treatment became more readily available. You know, the patent was broken yes. and in developing nations it was available, but there was so much stigma and shame about HIV that um, the, the more deprived communities wouldn't want to go to the clinic, wouldn't want to know their status and wouldn't know that there were drugs available. Um, so SAFE was putting on these public performances um, free of charge in kind of village squares and in public, which would attract 200 to 2,000 passers-by. Wow. And the premise of the plays are that the, that the hero's HIV positive and that the audience has to grow to love them, which they did. And then afterwards, um, people living positively, so people living with HIV but who had were on treatment and could talk about it, would speak on stage, public health officers would come and talk about what the facilities were available in the clinic. Um, and and, and at some of our performances, there would actually be testing uh, after the shows. So for me, I guess, because I come from Africa um, and you say, how did I enter the entertainment industry? I think knowing how much distress there is in the world, there was always a part of me that, that felt, you know, we're just so lucky. I am just so lucky to be able to do what I do for a living. Yes. Um, and also to have the privilege of a home, food, um, a great education and a great start to life, which I was given by um, by my family. Um, for me as a, a young person, because I was in my 20s and early 30s when I was involved in this charity, I think, um, I had to do it to sort of live with myself, to know that I was supporting actors in Africa who are as talented as, as me, but were using their talents not to be on the cover of magazines, but to actually change their society and yeah. literally save lives. Um, I found that hugely inspiring. Um, so I gave a lot of time. I was involved in that organization for a good 12 years. Yeah, that's that's so awesome. I know that your mother was was involved in some of the politics there. You know, how did she kind of look at you going into the acting field? Yes, my mother was um, the Minister of Education when I was growing yes. up, which was a long shadow. And uh, I suppose that's what got me to do something completely other than politics, you know, as far away as I could from that. But she, as an educator, she was always very supportive of vocational education, you know, that not everyone has to go to university. That's not, you know, uh, that's if it's for your taste. And there may be a whole panoply of other kinds of careers or crafts um, that you can flourish with. So... I was lucky. I had an Asian mom because I'm I'm half Chinese and I was raised by my Chinese yeah. Chinese and Barbican mom. But um, she was always very supportive of me following a vocation, and um, yeah, I'm very grateful for that. Yeah, I, I think that's awesome. So I got to mention that my grandkids are so into Thomas the Train, <laughs> and you've done some of the voices for that. They, I mean, love. The trains. But I wanted to yes. mention that you've done several several of the voices. Yes, I was um uh, in Thomas's Big World Adventure. 
Um, and I love that. I, I find I find that show so hilarious. Yeah, um, and 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 love having a side sideline um doing uh doing kids kids animation voices. Um, also have you have they gone into the octonauts? Oh yeah, well they're just starting to like I just started introducing them to them, but they were interested in it. Yeah. That. So yeah, and I know you've done at least one or two voices there too. Oh no, I I'm yeah, yeah, I'm a I'm a I play Min the map maker on on the Octonauts and uh, my 4-year-old can't really get his head around the fact that mummy is Min it just doesn't compete. <laughs> but um it's an amazing series because it's so educational. You yeah, know, it really is. Well, that's everything. why I started them watching it was because it it does kind of teach them yeah about yeah about wildlife and about aquatic life and about the environment um but yeah we're big into the octonauts in my house <laughs> well as he gets older and realizes what that means that you voice that's that's gonna be pretty great <laughs> yeah <laughs> one day it'll make sense yeah. right now it really doesn't <laughs> well and you were on this uh show that i absolutely loved called fortitude which was the weirdest show but I kind of found it by accident and and loved it. And I thought your role in that was really, really good. Yeah. I loved Fortitude. Um, it's a great show. I mean, I, it's such a great privilege being an actor because, because you get to work with people that, that you love, you know? So um, I was thrilled in that. Um, working with Stanley Tucci. Um, yeah. And the show I did last year, I got to work with Tim Robbins that was also one of you know sort of fan out at my at my co stars. Um, that's not bad. What was the show with uh, Tim? Um, I'm in this show that's coming up on Apple TV May fifth. Oh, um, I wanted to ask you about that. Yeah, what's the name of it? Silo. It's right. based on the Hugh Howey um, Wool trilogy. Oh, You're very into, nice. Have you gotten into this? Are you into wool? I, yeah, yeah, I know exactly what. The, yeah, I have read some of these. Um, the, yeah, I'm actually Is really, now that I know what it's about, I'm excited about it. Yeah, it's a trilogy of novels. I've only read the first one, but it was a really good book, like a real yeah. page. Turner. And then I know it's a, got a graphic novel and a fan base based on that. Um, but Silo, yeah, it's a very, I, I'm thrilled to be in that as well. Um, I'm in a couple of things on Apple TV. That seems to be my new home. Um, well, they uh, don't make bad television, so... Everything I've watched yeah. on Apple has been good. <laughs> yeah, and they've got a good, good sort of slant towards sci-fi, obviously, and future futurism. Um, well, you were in Foundation, and we've been lucky enough to talk to uh, several of that cast, and mm -hmm. uh, I, I love that show because I was always an Asimov reader growing up, and I was like, they're never going to make this into anything because it's so complicated. But mm -hmm. they did such a great job. I'm I'm excited for season two. Yeah, me too. I'm I'm not in season two of that, but um, yeah, it was. Well, pretty... you just be a fan at this point. Exactly. Yeah, <laughs> it was pretty awesome and epic. Um, yeah, I'm in the series um constellation that will be coming out much oh, later in the year. That sounds sci-fi too. Yeah. Yeah. Um. Numi Rapace is in that. Um, and that's a kind okay. of yeah, more astronaut kind of show. Um, so sci-fi is kind of my home. Um, I'm not sure why. But, I don't um, know, but that's part of the reason I'm such a fan of yours, is because you <laughs> it seems like you're always in the stuff I like. <laughs> good, good, yeah. No, um, yeah, um, Fortitude. I was a huge fan of, and and um, and we shot in Iceland as well. And I totally fell in love with Iceland. Yeah, it was I hear Iceland is awesome. pretty stunning. I mean, that's one of those experiences where uh, I'm so grateful for my job. We were staying in one village, and we were shooting in another town. And in order to get to work, we'd have this 45 minute drive, basically through a glacier to get to work and I was nice. looking at the car at this like amazing it's like National Geographic and that's my right to work <laughs> not bad um, that would definitely put you in the right mood for the day yeah yeah really moody and mysterious and epic yeah. um which fortitude was 
I love that. And I wanted to mention too that what my uh, uh, one of my favorite books growing up was Hound of, Hounds of the Baskerville. And you get to be <laughs> on that Sherlock where they kind of covered that, which I, I think was maybe the second season of that. But yeah, I yes. was in that too. Yes, that is indeed. I played a a, a reporter in that. Mm -hmm. um, yeah, it was actually um, yeah the second Benedict Cumberbatch um, series that that. Ooh, what was the first? Uh oh, you're making me scratch my head. Uh, <laughs> I want my MDB and check myself out. So yeah. I'm having a moment <laughs> on my yeah. six degree separation. <laughs> Well, you've been in enough stuff. You can play that game. <laughs> did I see you got to play uh, uh, Condoleezza Rice in something? I did. I That's did play awesome. Condoleezza Rice. Um, um, I did on a pretty, um, uh, it was a show in 2006 and it was called Fallujah. And it right. was you know, still when Fallujah was, just in quite a terrifying state um and at the time um i'm gonna date myself now um i was i was 28 and um condoleezza rice was 52 and i was like well can i play someone that much older than me um but i kind of figured Apparently. her out my condi thing um i figured out that you know uh she had a certain expression which was that she was it was, it was it was frowning and smiling at the same time. <laughs> yeah, get that and speak really seriously while frowning and smiling at the same time. That was my that's how I got into comedy. Love that. Yeah, I love that. <laughs> um, yeah, and but funnily, you know, taking on the part. This was a theater a theater um, piece. Uh, you sort of have those doubts. Am I going to be able to pull this off? Because I also look a lot younger than I am. So playing almost double my age. Um, but my current role, which I, I love to um, entertain my friends by telling them, well, what I'm doing now, I'm playing a 70-year-old. Really? Yeah. Yeah, what's that in? <laughs> um, in uh, this Hulu series, which is an adaptation of Charmaine Wilkerson's book Black Cake. Which oh, is a, yeah, so it, that's in. It's like in post or something right now. Yeah, yeah, it's in yeah. post now. I'm not sure when it's going to drop, but sometime this year. Um, and that was just one of those weird. Um, I love casting because there's such magic to it. Yeah. Um, you know why you the parts that you get the parts you don't get, but when you get a part um how it's strangely right for you and everyone's like really you're playing 70 how does that make <laughs> any sense at all especially when I look like 10 years younger than I am um but it's the story of a Chinese African and well, a Chinese black woman she's actually Jamaican um but part of her story is this having this split heritage um which is actually not that unique in jamaica there are a really? lot of yeah. yeah the chinese migration to jamaica um i think it was um through indentured servitude oh yeah um that's probably right uh unfortunately that's happened all over the world mm, different things and that yeah that's a lot of times when you have a group of people coming to a different country that's that's why yeah but um, Caribbean culture is very big in, in Britain. I'm not from here, but people often say, are you Jamaican? And I'm like, no, I'm from Zimbabwe. And they're like, you look like my Jamaican auntie. So, okay, <laughs> that's, that's cool. And I've always thought I could go to Jamaica one day and meet my people. Because in Zimbabwe, it was very rare being a half Chinese black person. Oh, right. Um, you know, I was the only one I knew growing up. Uh, and occasionally I remember being in a, uh, in a Chinese takeaway and seeing a Korean woman with like mixed race kids and be like sort of following them around saying, there, there's my people. <laughs> um, but yeah, wonderfully, I never imagined that I would um, be playing my actual authentic ethnic background. Um, and it's a wonderful thing that we're in this 
place and time where there are stories from different places that are being treated with respect. Yeah, you know, like that time. As I said, growing up, I grew up watching American movies and American stories. And, and uh, you know, uh, it's very easy for me to go to America. It's like, I know this place. I've been here since I was like five. <laughs> Um, but they were mainly, you know, white American centered, mainly Californian, really, to be honest. Sure. Um, and to have the Hollywood machinery of the entertainment industry support a story about a Jamaican origin woman and her epic journey through. Yeah, um, pretty great. Um, yeah, I'm really proud and pleased and privileged and just happy that we've gotten to. Um, the stage where you know we have been the viewers for a time now and it's about time that we were also the stories yeah agree yeah it's a it's really hollywood wise or entertainment wise around the world it's a pretty good time right now because it's mm -hmm. finally starting to get diverse where you're getting exposed to a lot of different cultures and and yeah. people that you haven't seen previously i i think it's great we it's missed out on a lot of good stories because of that mm -hmm. Yeah, and hopefully it's just the beginning, um, because like you know this this for instance this movement we have in this world we love South Korean television, you know that's a thing you know, yeah, um, and I hope that's just a doorway to a lot of other countries and cultures where yeah, me too. stories haven't been told. Yeah, me too. So I, I know we got to wrap up, but I wanted to mention uh, my son who does the editing for the uh, podcast. He's terrific at it. But his day job, he's a librarian, and he said that that you do a lot of the the books, like you'll do some of the books on Audible and stuff. And he would know, so I'm assuming that's correct. <laughs> I love the way that your podcast is this family family affair. It is, um, yeah, because it hits all levels. It's it's really sweet that it hits all levels of your grandkids and yeah. the grandparents and your son and all the different ways we take in media. And yes, I um, I said, I, when I was younger, I, I love reading. And my first parts were, my first part I can remember playing was not Mary in the school play. It was the narrator who got to stand on the side. <laughs> so you've got a very, a very nice kind of calming voice. So I, I can <laughs> see where you'd be. A good oh, because you know what my first big break in, in the movies was? What? Was... Um, was playing the voice of Icarus in Sunshine. That That's was my right. that was my first time on a big movie set. Was and and I was there. I was you know Icarus is great character, um, but it was just my voice. Um, but yeah, I've read some fantastic books, um, mainly by Zimbabwean women writers. But some of them are are really awesome. Um, the most recent one I read is a book called Glory by a Zimbabwean writer, American-based, um, called No Violet Bulawayo. Oh. And it's a kind of animal farm version of the last few years of oh, I like that. Banana Republic in Zimbabwe and the craziness that's gone on, but as played by sheep and donkeys. Um, <laughs> it's kind of hilarious and kind of not that hilarious because... Yeah. Well, because you know the real story. Well, because some of it is kind of verbatim what was happening and the things that people were saying, and it was that absurd, you know. Um, but it's some of the most powerful stuff I've 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 ever read, and and I mean, reading books is staggering. Uh, if you want to know what the most challenging job as an actor is, it's yeah, it's reading that, books. It's basically like a thirteen-hour one-woman show, you know. <laughs> yeah, no pressure there. <laughs> and you got, you got like a recording space that you can get away from everything and, re and record? Um, well, they're, they're generally done in studio. Oh, okay. Yeah. Um, but Glory was definitely one where I was very specific that I was not going to do it consecutive days. I had to have a break. You know, I'll do two days and have to have a break for a few days and then come back because it actually took all of my um craft as yeah. an actor to read that book um i highly recommend it yeah you wouldn't want to do that if you're a little tired 
after you know if no. you've had a couple long days reading you don't want to short the story near the end so no. yeah you should take some time yeah 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 um i i, I appreciate um your son having having listened to to some of those books he surprises me all the time with the stuff mm -hmm. that he listens to but he's he's the uh children's librarian but he covers a lot of different things because he likes to be able to recommend things when people come in so he you know he has a a very wide variety on his uh, reading list but i love that because he surprises me all the time with what he's reading or listening to he does a lot of the books on tape which I guess a lot of younger people do because they they multitask everything they're doing. So they're listening while they're doing something else. Yeah. Yeah. Yes. I mean, I used to be a great reader, but now I I honestly I mainly read for work. So yeah. if there's a book that there's like, well, I read it instantly. Um and um other things, but it's background, I'll read them multiple times. But reading for fun, I listen to Audible. <laughs> yeah well it's tough if you're if you're reading for a job it'd be tough to read for fun it's a, it's a lot you, you you probably want to do something different when you're off <laughs> thank you you've actually made me feel much better <laughs> yeah you should yeah I've, i struggle because i was such a reader growing up and i i don't read nearly as much now but we you know the way we take in data and knowledge has changed so you know there's I'm doing so much more reading, you know, online that I'm, I've gotten away from holding the book in my hand, which is the part I really like. Yeah. 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 Well, uh, Chipo, thank you so, so much. This has been great. I knew you would be such a terrific interview. I really appreciate you coming on. Thank you. I've had so much fun just being in dialogue with you. I really, um, yeah, really appreciate that. Yeah, it was a good conversation. and. And your son did pretty good. He did. Yes. Um, he slept through it. And um, that was a, you were involved in my family life too. That's right. That's right. I was, I was the test. <laughs> <laughs> yes. He stayed in bed and didn't interrupt us. <laughs> yeah, he did good. He did good. So a couple of quick things before we go. Um, anything else that you're working on that we can keep an eye out? Um, I think I have mentioned it. It's a, it's a fun year for things coming out. Um, yeah, you got a bunch uh, coming out. Yes. Yeah. It's going to be a fun year to watch stuff. Silo's coming out May 5th and then, um, I'm waiting for the date. I'm excited like about now that, that we've talked about a little bit and I understand what it's about. Yeah. That's exciting. It's really good. Yeah. I love um, I love the uh, uh, Apple shows. As I said, I've watched many of them. I've yet to find one I didn't like, which that's they've obviously got pretty good people picking the shows that they're doing. Yeah, yeah, they've got this one. There's great material. The book is great material, and then it was fun to watch um, the showrunners um, Graham Yost and Eric Avellino to see how they adapted the book but also when you're doing a show how many times they it gets rewritten and and sometimes you're doing a show and it's sort of being tweaked as you go along they're like yeah. slight adjustments these guys would like this is a completely different episode from the one there was before um it's just a completely different take which i i i found quite eye-opening because um we were talking about directing earlier my pivot um through COVID, like a lot of people, like the whole world had a pivot. Um, yes. But mine was um, into writing because finally oh, I had the time on my hands to write. So I've got a few things that I'm working on as a writer. And it was thrilling working. Um, I guess that was my plan as a college student. I was like, I'm going to act. I'm going to learn how to yep. direct, you know, how it works from being an actor. Yeah. Um. And it was really thrilling as a as a wannabe writer director to see how on Silo they can be so true to the book, like they've really realized the book, but they've made extensive changes to it, and we're doing it on a regular basis. Like um, how you can have that uh, freedom and flexibility while being absolutely right. true to part of it. Um, so that was great for me to observe um, as a as a learning process. Yeah, that's awesome. 
Yeah, that's terrific. Okay, so last thing before we go, um, where can we find you on social media? I am pretty active on Instagram. I'd yeah. say Instagram is my favorite. Um, and what am I? I'm at cheapo.chung, I think. I think that's right. I think that's I think right. there's a dot in the middle of that one. Um, and I am on Twitter and I'm on Facebook, Cheapo Chung on Facebook. Um, I love the photos. I, I like yeah, I like the stories, the stories through pictures. Um, I am on Twitter and you can find me on Twitter. Um, I'm much more of a follower on Twitter. Yeah, me too. Um, I you you have to have it just in case you need to know what's going on. I, I, I follow it. I read a lot of news and, and follow arguments. Um, but I find that Twitter can be so um, destructive. I watch yes. it. And, oh, this looks scary. So I, I don't really like to get. I know Instagram's much nicer with strangers. <laughs> yeah, I agree. <laughs> I mean, Instagram's much nicer. You're sharing photos of your food or what yeah. you're doing. You know, it's pretty yeah. good. One day I'll, I'll be hip, hip, hip enough to get onto TikTok, but I'm showing my age. <laughs> I'm on there, but it's kind of similar. I'll post videos from the show, but, you know, I'm not one that's going to try any of the dances or anything. <laughs> 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 There's some talented people on there. <laughs> there people making money off of it. Yeah, it's I know. I know. <laughs> well, Chibo, thank you so, so much. This has been great. And I hope you'll come back at some point. Yeah, it, well, it's been an absolute pleasure talking to you, Mike. Um, yeah, hand on heart. Thank you. Well, you're so welcome. Okay, hold on one second. Well, I did it again. I've went a while without messing up a, a name and then uh, messed up with uh, Cheapo's name. Um, I'm really bad about that. And part of it's because I was such an avid reader growing up that names especially i would just read them the way they looked to me and it always um it kind of confounded me when i would see an adaption of a book i read and the name was different in how than how i was pronouncing it in my head it took me a while to kind of get the get past that but for whatever reason i've struggled my entire life <laughs> with different pronunciations. And one great thing with this podcast is I've, I'm meeting such a wide variety of people that it has educated me on a lot of different things in different cultures. So I've, I've really, really enjoyed that part of it. And she was so nice about correcting me. I'm sure she's had to do that with other people. You know, some people get very uh, annoyed or agitated if you get their name wrong. She was not like that. She was just great. Uh, I'm such a fan of her as an actress, and I'm sure you are too. Um, she's just been in so many great shows, and I think we touched on most of that. She did some uh, work for a World of Warcraft game that, uh, that I meant to mention that and didn't. She was on this show with the um, woman that starred in Castle uh, called Absentia. I think I'm probably... I'm probably pronouncing that wrong too, but she played a, a, a like a law enforcement agent in that and, and was really, uh, really good. We kind of touched on Into the Badlands. I thought she was terrific on that, really enjoyed her um, in that role. And I think the rest of the stuff we covered um, pretty well. And she's so active, you know, with, uh, with uh, several different causes, very commendable. I just, think uh, she's uh, terrific so hopefully you enjoyed that we talked a little bit about foundation um, which is an absolutely terrific show if you haven't checked it out it's on apple and we have had uh i'm, I'm so proud of the guests we've had from that show we had uh, leah harvey uh amy tiger alexander sittig and cooper sate uh we've got a playlist on our youtube channel meistercon pod if if you like that show then check out uh, those four interviews as well as uh, Cheapos, and those will all be on there. Also, while you're there, you could really help us out if you would just hit subscribe. You know, it's it's those subscriptions that we take to kind of entice guests to come on the show. A lot of times we don't need them, but sometimes we do, and, and that really helps us out, and it's free. You just uh, hit 
subscribe. If you're listening, it's the same thing, but wherever you listen to your podcast at or whatever application you're using, just subscribe there. Help us just as much. Really appreciate that. You can find we're closing in on 600 episodes. You can find all of those on our website, MeisterCon.com. I'll give you the audio and video so you can watch uh, or listen to either one. It'll let you know if we're doing anything in studio, if we're going on location, covering a convention. You know, whatever we have going on, be on the website. So definitely check us out there, MeisterCon.com. Thank you guys so, so much. Until next time. Bye, everybody.